It is my pleasure to welcome Rufus Wainwright to the show. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I no, nothing to complain about. I have. I'm not used to seeing you. Not this is a strange thing to say to you, but I'm, I'm not used to seeing you without the robe. Yeah. No. It's it's it's, it's the same setup. I mean, I'm at my piano and in my living room, but yeah. No. I'm uh, I, I I'm usually with the robe every day. Actually, in the morning, I get up and and, and I do play for a couple hours in the morning. So it's uh, it's uh, it's verite, shall we say? But but now it's later in the day, so. I mean, it, it felt like all those things, all those early, you know, the robe recitals and, and friends of mine doing piano lessons, they were all sort of early days of the pandemic. And now yeah. we've sort of, we've sort of all just settled into it right now. We're kind of leaning yeah. into it. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, uh, there, in retrospect, there's something kind of um, almost acute <laughs> about that period in terms, I mean, at least, especially in California, not if you're, you lived in New York, uh, obviously, but, but here, yeah, there was. I, I look. I think whimsically on those robe recital days when uh, we were, you know, so dedicated and things looked, you know, like we we had it under control. But now, now we got to put our clothes on <laughs> and actually deal with the situation. <laughs> I don't like it. I liked it a lot better when I could just wear a robe yeah. and listen to old songs. That was great for me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, this is a great. This is a great record, and it's been eight years since you made your last pop record and you took a break to pursue opera after that and i heard you say that taking a break felt like a bit of a risk uh but a bit of a necessary one could you tell me about yeah. that yeah yeah i mean i mean it's not often that that a fairly successful you know uh singer songwriter will just walk away for 10 years uh and and just and, and go into a whole other um avenue um Though it's not uncommon either. I mean, it's it's. I, I think there was. I definitely felt the need that you know. I felt the the need to explore these you know urges that I've had all my life really uh, concerning opera and to really you know um, uh, test that out and so forth. And uh, so I went with that. But I, in retrospect, uh, it, it was a very good idea because if anything. Uh, it, it gave gave me a greater love and a greater appreciation for where I came from, in terms of pop music and 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 really um, and and a sense of perspective and too. Uh, uh, so so it's good to be back. Did you did you did did, did you have a same a new arsenal of tools in your pop songwriting because of opera, or was it more like putting on an old robe? Yeah, <laughs> well, it was an old robe that had been washed. <laughs> <laughs> It, it, I don't like, I hate the term crossover <laughs> and I, and I'm very adamant that, you know, what, if I'm doing opera, mm -hmm. I'm really, you know, that's what I'm doing. Or if I'm doing pop songwriting, that's what I'm doing. Um, but I don't, I do understand that in, you know, voy voyaging uh, t between both worlds that there will be, you know, some seepage, you know, and, uh, and so, so I, I think that happens naturally, but I don't like to push that envelope. Um, I like will you, say you, know, you, you weren't yeah. sitting down and going like, oh, well, I'm, I'm writing this song on the piano. Oh, geez, I never thought about doing that before, you know? No, no, I didn't. I mean, there was a couple of melodies that, you know, were originally pop songs that I, that I then sort of jiggered to, um, to work in the opera. And, and even vice versa, there's a piece from the opera that now I kind of sing as more of a folk song. So that, that, that occurred, but that, that's really the, the, uh, the, 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 you know, the, 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 the the most uh, kind of obvious change. But I, as I said before, I think it's, I think when any artist decides to um, explore other avenues, um, he or she will always uh, be, you know, come back with, uh, with, with vestiges of, of, of their, of their voyage. So, so it's, um, I think it's a good thing to do for anyone uh, artistically well, to let, get away. Let's, let's uh, take a listen to a little bit of this voyage. This is uh, the title track. This is on follow the rules. <laughs> That is Rufus Wainwright with Unfollow the Rules from his new album of the same name. I tell you what I'm not going to ask you is what that song is about, because I, <laughs> I found myself so moved by it, and oh. I, I, but I wasn't entirely sure why. Yeah. 
And yeah, well, I, I'm not either. That's I don't the thing. Know what it's about. I watched the video of you and talking about it, and you were like, "I'm not entirely. I'll never be able to tell you what it's about." Yeah, yeah. No, it's this strange amalgamation of of many factors in my life. Both, you know, I mean, the, the term "unfollow the rules" came from my daughter, our daughter Viva, who uh, is uh, who just one day walked into the living room and exclaimed that she was officially unfollowing the rules, <laughs> and uh, and I, being you know. The good father just said, oh, there, there's a lyric in there. <laughs> and this promptly went off and started writing a song. But um, so so there's that. But then, you know, I think the other thing that occurred is that I've, you know, I, I, I'm now, you know, 47 and or 46, I should say. I'll be 47 this month, but not yet. And, uh, you know, I've, I've done I've had to do, you know, therapy over the years and and, and really, you know, reevaluate my life a few times. And, and that, and that, and so part of that is in there. And then also there's, um, there's a kind of, um, yearning, I think it, uh, one, one, one interesting where I actually finished the song, uh, was I was on an amazing trip in Northern BC in, uh, and, and we were in Haida Gwaii, which mm. is this great island up, up in, near Alaska anyways. But we, uh, and we had just gone to see these, uh, these really phenomenal um, uh, totem poles, mm-hmm. and 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 there was definitely something about that spiritual experience that uh, that kind of sealed the deal for this song. So it's yeah, it's a combination of things. We had the artist on. What was his name, Deanne? We had the artist on the other day who was the first person to put a totem pole back up at Haida Gwaii after it had wow. been outlawed, and it was only wow. in 1965 that he defied. He went to a museum, right. his, and he saw the totem pole of his people in the museum, and he said, "Why? Oh, geez, did we lose Rufus?" Oh no, 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 no! Hold on. Hold and... on. Hello. You got a call, I bet. I bet that's what it was. Yes, yes, yes. I figured Sorry. as much. So yeah, I was talking. Was, his name was Robert Davidson, and he in the '60s put up the first totem in Haida, hit it in Haida Gwaii. After you know years of it being outlawed, I've never been. I hear it's very powerful to to see them. It's an incredible place. It's it's one of the most unusual and uh, kind of most um, moving moving spots I've ever been to in my life. What what brought you up there? Um, you know, there was a, a trip that uh, you're, you're calling me in my home, so <laughs> that's the way the world works at the moment. Uh, with the pandemic. Um, is that us calling you? Well, uh, I guess that person is trying to get through, but I'll, I'll, I'll do, I'll, uh, you're, you're more important. Oh, Rufus, I appreciate um, it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, we, we, we'd heard about it. Um, and I think from Adrian Clarkson, actually, perhaps. Um, and, uh, you know, because we were living in Toronto at the time uh, and, uh, and we really wanted to explore more of Canada. So, so, uh, oh, and the other thing is that there's a famous story, there's a famous book, or, or famous, it's a well-known book called The Golden Spruce, which um, is a sort of, it's a story, it, it's an, a true story that occurred on Haida Gwaii where there was this mystical tree that was cut down by an activist. Anyways, it's it's, it's a whole other series. Of <laughs> sure, but, so, but what was it about going say. there that led you to finishing the song? Yeah, yeah, excuse me? What, what was it about the, being there that led you to finishing the song? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, what, what what it was is that I had we'd gone to visit the totem poles uh, on this island, very remote island, which was off the coast of, or it was at the top, the northern part of Haida Gwaii or something. It was very far from the vill- the town that we were staying in. And then we had this eight hour, uh, boat. what maybe it was about five hours, I would say, boat ride in, in the free in the freezing cold, you know, very rough water back to uh, to camp and. Uh, and there was something, and that was the boat ride, and it just on that ride, it, it all kind of came together, and um, and and as I said, it was, it, it is, it, the song in a certain way is kind of a totem pole. I mean, it's there are these different elements just sort of on top of each other, which um, relate and don't relate. Mm. <laughs> it's it's interesting, and you mentioned that your daughter Viva, you know, inspired the title uh, "Unfollow the Rules." She has. Um, her, her writing is in the middle of the vinyl record. Yeah. And it's interesting to hear it as a, as a fan of yours. You know, when I listen back to that very first record of this, you know, sort of rakish man yeah. about town, gad about in, in Montreal and in New York City. Yeah. And to hear you now uh, in your late 40s with a family, 
you know, staying at home and, and, and gone through all these things. Yeah. I have to tell you, I don't hear, I don't hear an unbelievable difference in your songwriting. <laughs> how, how are you feeling? How do you think that family yeah. life has maybe changed your music? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I, you know, it's funny because b- before COVID, um, the last big tour that I did was, was, uh, my 20th anniversary tour, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, 20th, uh, anniversary of, of the, that first record, Rufus Wainwright, and Poses. So, so, um, so I had a chance to to re uh, visit a, a lot of that early material and sing it. And I was very, I was very pleasantly surprised at how well the song stood up. Um, uh, not all of them, but 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 a, but a good chunk of them. And and how, in a in a sense. Um, I do feel strongly that 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 uh, regardless of what's occurred in my life, you know, addiction, children, you know, love, marriage, hate, all of that stuff. Um, and when it came down to writing music and um, and focusing on lyrics and you know making records, I always had a very high standard, and I was always incre- incredibly, um, you know, driven and, and 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 did not compromise in that department. And so, so yeah, I don't think there's a tremendous difference now uh, between uh, between my material um, and then. I will say though that the the the, the element that that has changed quite drastically is my voice. I'm a much better singer now. A better singer uh, than, I, than I used to be. Yeah, yeah, much better singer. Uh, just in terms of breathing and pronunciation, pronunciation, and really trying to you know, focus on the, um, you know, the different, uh, on the depth of a song. You're defying that thing that as people get older, they're supposed to drop things down by semitones. No, well, I mean, a, a couple of things I've had to drop down, but actually my voice has oddly gotten higher, but, 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 I, but I only say this and I, and this, and, this, and it's not in, in a kind of egotistical way, meaning that the, the, the trajectory that I, that I followed because of my great love of opera is really that of an opera singer in the sense that, that in that world, it's 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 truly in your 40s and 50s even where you're at your peak vocally. That's what you train your whole life to be able to sing uh, when you when you flower and and all the big roles are available to you. You know at that point. So so I think I just had that in mind uh, while I was working um, on my voice for years, and and I you know it's uh it's it's paying off now. Um, I want to play another song from the record. Take a listen to this. I am a prince of men Who was raised to soon be king All I can do is fight All I can do is rise Behind the square of slow Under the English moon There I learn to survive So much That is Rufus Wainwright from his new album Unfollow the Rules a song called Damsel in Distress. A song um, I was I saw inspired by Joni Mitchell, who I was told you weren't allowed to listen to growing up. Yeah. Is that right? That is true. Why yeah. not? I mean, she wasn't, well, uh, my mother, the great, the late, great Kate McGarrigal, was, was a profound uh, and brilliant and uh, electrifying songwriter in her own right, you know? And, and I don't think even got as, as much attention as she deserved. Uh, by the end of her her life, um, but that being said, she was so so she had you know credentials, uh, but and she but she was also very much part of a a kind of uh, strict uh, movement uh, in in the folk world that was heavily um, uh, kind of dedicated to you know purity uh, and you know to the truth and to uh, you know the, the 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 source of where a lot of folk music came from. So. So they were more like Pete Seeger uh, followers, and or they would like listen to field recordings or, or you know, ancient you know harmonies and stuff. So, so, so that was uh, that was really her um, mo. And you know, Joni Mitchell had had broken out of that, and uh, and so I think my mother, did, you know, she was just very weary of that um, leery, I should say, leery of that of that of that concept. I think also my mother was quite jealous mm. <laughs> of her success and her fame and her you know, her freedom and stuff. So, 
So I think it was a, on one hand, it was, it was a philosophical difference, which I, which I respect. But on the other hand, it was, it was also just human frailty. And, and you, you tell the story about how your husband, you know, becomes obsessed yeah. with, yes. jo- with Joni Mitchell's music. And then you have to start investigating it for the first time. Yeah. Sort of yeah, the way yeah, that people no. listen to Black Sabbath, you know, like, you know, uh, in the nighttime, they're not supposed to listen to it, this, you know, evil music. And you're finally listening yeah, to Joni. Yeah, yeah, no, it was, it was definitely, I had to, I had to, uh, I do not think I would have been able to do those Joni Mitchell songs and kind of really uh, gone in to the extent that I have um, and, and even, you know, become friends with her uh, if my mother had still been alive. It would have been, I would have felt like I was betraying her. How did you feel when um, you met her? How did you feel when you met Joni? Oh, I, you know, I, I think she's an amazing woman. Um, I, you know, I, as I said, my, my husband, Jorn, who was brought up in Germany and doesn't, they didn't really know Joni Mitchell at all. He, he had no idea who she was. So he, um, so for him, it was an honest to God discovery. And I was able to go on that journey with him and it was so fabulous. And then, and, and then we got to meet her and hang out with her. And that to me, I mean, yes, I, her, her writing and, and her, and her music is, 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 is phenomenal. And I love singing it especially. Um, but that being said, I, for, for me, her personality is really kind of the most fascinating um, uh, facet of, of, of her being. I mean, she's just such a, I don't know, there's an aura that she emanates that, um, that really, um, I don't know. It's 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 astoundingly powerful, and 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 just to be in her presence is is really, is really a, a great honor. So, so I'm, I, yeah, I've heard that she's, I don't know. I hate this expression, but sort of down to earth. Like she'll yes. she she'll talk to you. She's not you know oh, yeah, floating no, above no. the clouds like Joni Mitchell. Yeah, I mean there was. I mean it's hard to for me to gauge right now because you know I knew her both ways. I mean I knew her before her her. Um, her aneurysm, yeah. you know, and, and and then after, and and I don't in any way feel like, you know, uh, putting you know, putting a positive slant on what occurred because you know it, it's been very difficult for her and so forth. But that being said, you know, my my grandmother had strokes mm-hmm. at a certain point and then went into a heavy duty depression and really became you know very incapacitated and very angry and very unhappy that didn't really happen to Joni mm-hmm. <laughs> it, it affected her I mean it certainly affected her move her movement which is tragic but her personality softened right. she became very she became a little more gentle and, and very kind of I don't know a little less sort of anxious about you know the way the world was so it was I don't know I mean I I, I found her present her presence very healing and did, very did you tell her did you tell her you weren't allowed to listen to her I think she found out about it. She heard about it at <laughs> one point, uh, you know, which I don't think anybody likes to hear. You know, I, 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 in fact, I'm a little, I'm a little, um, I, you know, I, I, I tend to talk about my life and, and I, I don't have that many filters and sometimes I wish I'd been more diplomatic, but, uh, but Hey, I've never been able to master that art. <laughs> um, I only have a couple of questions for you. And one, I'm not entirely sure if you're going to be able to answer, but I kind of wanted to throw it at you anyway, is because um, you're, you're such a gifted melody writer from the very beginning. And I don't I don't always know if you've gotten the acclaim that you deserve specifically for your melodies. I wonder if you could shine a light on a little bit about how you approach melody mm-hmm. writing. Is it just something yeah. you, is, is it, is it sort of generative, like Kerouac, you just sit down and open up your mouth and see what comes out or yeah. you're more deliberate yeah. about it? Well, I mean, I in pop music, I it, say. it it come it, it's a constant flow <laughs> of, of of melodic inspiration, uh, and, and I'm always you know I will often be struck with with uh, with 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 uh, little notes you know uh, shooting around and um, and so and I and I know how to pick them up and 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 run with them. That being said, I'm also on on the other end, and I think this is very important. I am feeding the beast uh, a, a, a lot in terms of, you know, I listen to operas, I listen to Brazilian music, I listen to classic, you know, American songwriting. And um, and, and so I, I think that there is, and it's funny because it's a bit of a, I don't know what happens in between. <laughs> uh, you know, it's not a deliberate kind of uh, process, but but I think it's important to, to, to intake as much as you kind of output. Um, you don't necessarily have to fashion them together, but but I think there's a there's a non, nonetheless a, a relationship there. Is there a me, uh, is there a melody in your career that you're most proud of? And if that's too challenging, yeah. is there a melody in your career that you're most you're particularly proud of? 
Well, I mean, the, the one that comes right off my head is Poses. You know, I think that that was a melody that, uh, I don't know, that, that really had a, had, a, had a kind of, that to this day has a life of its own, you know, and I, I just I just felt like at that moment when that was written, I was I was just sort of a vessel um, translating some message from somewhere else. So, so Poses has always uh, has served me well. Um, and, uh, you know, I've, there's some other good ones. I mean, I mean, right now with what's going on in America, uh, you know, going to a town is sadly, uh, relevant once more. And, um, and that's, and that's, uh, that's a good tune. Mm-hmm. I've always loved the art teacher. Can I tell you that? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, the, the art teacher is, uh, is, is also a good a, a good example of, of, of getting lost <laughs> in melody. I'm getting a note to stop nerding out with you about your songs. <laughs> um, okay. you, you said that Unfollow the Rules feels like a bookend to your debut self-titled album, the one that came yes. out um, all those years ago in 1998. What does that mean? What, is that, what does the next chapter look like then? Well, you know, I was brought up in Montreal and I did go to French school for a long time and, and I've developed... Uh, uh, quite a following in France um, and uh, and other parts of the French world. So so I, I I'd love to make a French record at some point, um, but I'm kind of set on it not being typical in the sense like I I love of course I love classic French chanson. I love Edith Piaf. I love you know Barbara. All of these great uh, or, or Serge Gainsbourg, and I sing a lot of that material. But I'd kind of like to do something completely divorced from that concept, do something very French, but very new and very uh, avant-garde and very, I don't know, something really kind of a bit off the wall. So, But I hope, so that, I hope it means you're still going to make more pop records, though. Oh, yeah. No, it'll be pop-inspired. I mean, I'm thinking of, you know, you know, going to Daft Punk people or yeah. going to... There's a really good friend of mine, Wood Kid, who's a great uh, uh, Parisian uh, singer-songwriter, and he's... He has contacts in this, you know, very, you know, very sh- chic and cool young crowd in France. So I'm hoping to, you know, be enveloped by youth and hipness. <laughs> <laughs> so is this is this the last? I mean, I gotta ask then. Is this the last English pop record? No. Good. No, I doubt, no, no, I doubt it. I doubt it. I'm just, you know, I like to like boomerang around so. Well, I, I I always try to hold it until the end of the interview with you. But you know what a fan <laughs> I am, and it's lovely to talk to you. Oh, well, thank you so much.